Well, a happy Friday morning to you and welcome to Talking Point on the premier platform for Caribbean content. This is WESN. I'm Keaton Shaw. I'm in a happy mood this morning because it is the end of the week and uh, we get to take a, a bit of a break from all the uh, stresses and all the concerns associated with the, the various conversations that we seek to have. Um, but nevertheless, I'm always very happy to be here to welcome you to the program and to have those discussions. This morning, we will be focusing more so on Tobago, taking a look at the latest happenings there. And then later on in the program, we will welcome our guest where we're speaking specifically on agriculture but more so on intellectual property rights and agriculture, of course, intellectual property rights as a legal framework, legal protection for innovation and for the creative minds and creative mindsets. But uh, as we get into those conversations this morning, let me introduce my co-host, colleague, my good friend alongside me, Mr. Sean Michael Small. Good morning, Sean. Good morning, Keith. And yes, Tobago is a, as a topic is somewhat more easily forgotten than others because it's not as though most of the country could drive past Tobago and, and see what's going on. Yeah, that, that's, that's the interesting um, dichotomy of, of our twin island republic. Now there are areas in Trinidad as well where obviously the traffic does not flow past them because they're at the extremities of the south or the east. So you're not going to get a lot of people to be aware necessarily of what goes on there if the, the residents don't send out videos, do a protest or whatever with regards to water problems or, or infrastructure problems or uh, any other concern. Uh, but Tobago being so isolated and having a certain amount of infrastructure and, and, and businesses that it has to support, being a tourist island, the whole situation has affected it. And Tobago has still been very extremely negatively affected by the pandemic. I think we take it for granted in Trinidad because we have the, the veneer of we're almost back. You know, things don't seem too, too different than when it was during the, the, the lulls of the pandemic or, or during the points where things were open, maybe just before or even just after the first lockdown. But with Tobago, there, there's a when you go there, and it, uh, from what I understand, it's more or less just like when we were there in, in December for the elections. Mm -hmm. you, you feel the emptiness. And while there are some um, businesses that are doing okay with regards to guest houses, villas, or hotels, they're doing okay. For the majority of them, that's not the case. And now the question is, is that an indicator of Tobago's economy on a whole? Because, you know, that lack of people, you saw it with regards to a lot of the food and beverage places. They themselves did not have a lot of customers. Your no. roads, the, the, the retail outlets, the, everything you're, just felt empty. You're asking that question from the perspective of the macroeconomy of Trinidad and Tobago, not just the microeconomy well, of Tobago. Even, even just Tobago. Because, because as, as you know, uh, you know uh, it is Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah. And, and there is budgetary support exclusively for Tobago. Right. And the thing is, tourism, contrary to what a lot of politicians would have you believe, because every government will give a lot of lip service to tourism. But on a practical level, it's not really nationally a uh, priority. So I don't, I'm not necessarily aware, because we got to figure over the debate from Carnival, 16 billion um, is brought in by the entertainment sector. I'm sure it's, uh, it might be a similar figure from, from tourism, but how much of that is just people coming in for the carnival season? Because I, it's not just for the two days. People will come in a week before, two weeks before, a month before to go to the fets, to go to the parties, et cetera, et cetera. So the national figure is one thing. What is Tobago's figure? How much is it reliant on something like tourism? And it, just to put into context the, the uphill battle that it might be, because not all of the economy is dependent on it, but we know Crown Point area, Bon Accord, a lot of, a lot of the southern end. You know, it's almost as though those businesses have no customers. Well, the, uh, the thing is, is that uh, we can answer the question simply based off of, of our experience and, and what we know and what we've learned over the last couple of months. Tobago is certainly dependent upon tourism to ensure that its microeconomy is driven. Uh, however, 
I do believe that Tobago over the last few years has been looking to diversify not outside of tourism but within tourism for example they're looking at ecotourism um, more specifically as well they're looking at investment. Tobago has quite a bit of land mm. and that is something that you can consider in terms of investments. I know that in islands so for example I believe St Lucia and Grenada they are stating that if you come to, to Grenada, St Lucia, you invest uh, for example, buying a piece of land that has a minimum uh, price, a minimum value of this amount, we offer you citizenship. Now, whether or not people see citizenship of Trinidad and Tobago being something of value to them, that's a separate argument that is all up to the individual and the individual investor. But that is also another area that I think that they can focus on. I know that they're focusing on ecotourism. And that that alone says that perhaps they kind of think outside the box related to tourism. I mean, what else does Tobago have to offer besides tourism? And, and that's not that's not a question, by the way, to, to try and put Tobago and Tobagonians down. Mm -hmm. I'm asking that question because I want to know as an individual, I think what else are you offering? To some extent, there is the potential for agriculture, um, that the similar potential, just obviously on a smaller scale. Um, outside of that, well, Tobago also is a site of, technically, of, of, of part of the oil and gas reserves of the country. So Tobago, with regards to manufacturing and production, is no worse off than Trinidad, really. I think right now, um, both islands, I believe, still have cocoa estates running to, to various degrees of, of, of scale. And um, with regards to food production in Tobago, there are some people who are trying to do farming, hydroponics, um, was, was one of them, but uh, of course a lot of it is still imported with the added cost of having to, anything that's imported has to, to have that extra leg of coming across the, the ferry or the cargo ferry to Tobago. So what else can be done? It, it's, it's an interesting question because unfortunately a lot of the businesses that already exist is already kind of focused towards that point of tourism. And if not tourism, construction or, or infrastructure support for those type of businesses. Well, I certainly believe, at least in my opinion, that ruin and farming is an avenue for investment. Um, the Prime Minister, in fact, himself has a, a farm in Tobago, a ruin and farm. I think it's a goat and sheep. Mm. Um, and, and that was another observation that you and I made when we were in Tobago that there is a lot of uh, goats and sheep farming in Tobago. Well, goats, I'm not so sure right. about sheep. But, well, I'm, I'm just speaking yeah. generally. Yeah. There, you know, goats and sheep, that's, that's the, the classification they refer to. Right, right. Um, but, you know, that, that is certainly an area for investment. We're speaking about hydroponics and agriculture. I know that there's investment and that is due to come into effect, I think, uh, later this year in relation to a berry farm in Tobago, which is interesting because, uh, you know, if you go to the supermarket now, and you look to buy berries, all of which are imported, cherries, strawberries, blueberries, it's expensive, but people still purchase it. It's deemed as a luxury food item, but people enjoy it, so they purchase it. If we're able to have a local market supplying those goods to Trinidad and Tobago, that in itself is a very, very good investment. But the most important thing is that it's actually based in Tobago. See, part of the problem is we don't necessarily have systems to support moving away from business as usual. And that includes tourism, because most of our tourism systems are privately owned. We, we have two tourism development companies, a division of tourism and a ministry of tourism. As far as I'm aware, up until recently, no, or before the pandemic, because the pandemic has its own set of circumstances, those four entities didn't do much to market Tobago, right? We in Trinidad watching foreign TV have seen far more, and by far more I mean there have been no ads for Tobago, but you see ads for... Not for Trinidad. Right, but you see ads for the other islands. St. Lucia, so, St. Kitts, Barbados, St. Vincent, Jamaica. Yes, you do. In fact, I, I was quoting to, to one of our colleagues a couple of days ago. Uh, we were having the same discussion. In England, you hear mm -hmm. advertising on the radio stations for these islands. So the point is, are we really serious about trying to do anything differently? Even making a change with tourism takes a lot of effort. 
if you're reliant on the private sector to do it, the private sector is not a singular entity with one person under the head telling all the different private sector entities what to do as part of a larger plan. It's a lot of small stakeholders that aren't necessarily going to band together automatically. So the same issue we would have with any sort of agricultural endeavor. There is no vision or plan to consult because it helps if you get all these stakeholders moving in one direction. So it helps when government provides some amount of leadership, some amount of support to get it moving in a direction. It's not about government paying all the bills and you know uh, waiving all the taxes. It's about showing some sort of structure and leadership to move forward. Both islands have this problem, by the way, I would argue. And until we get some sort of singular sense of purpose, whether it comes from an umbrella organization of the private sector or from the government itself, I don't know if we're really going to see much of any headway into any either of these avenues, really. Because Tobago's tourism, the potential has always been there. And Tobago's tourism has shrunk. And you could argue the agriculture on both islands, for all intents and purposes, might have shrunk or, or no. have gotten less priority in, I, in the national sphere. I disagree with you in terms of, okay, fine. In terms of the national sphere, definitely. I don't think it's shrunk, though. I think it's exploded over the, the course of the pandemic, at least. Um, the pandemic, I, but, but yes, take the pandemic but that out. Is where, that is where I think, in a way, you know, it, it's one positive of the pandemic. I think we were discussing right, this but, a couple months ago. But the problem ago. is, it's similar to oil. When the situation goes back to how it was before, we tend to want to go back but to how it this, was before. We don't thing. want actual long-term change. This is the thing. This wasn't on the doing of the government. This wasn't on the part of the government. I think citizens, to a certain extent, did not have much of a there's, choice, but took it into their own hands. There's a reason why agriculture was very difficult before the pandemic, and that's because foreign food was so much cheaper. Now, the, the, the food prices to import might continue for a while, but eventually, what's going to cause, when it goes back, when the, when the pendulum swings the other way, what's going to prevent us from getting stuck in the same situation again? Because you can't argue, well, we should just pay more money for locally grown food just because. You need to actually put things in place to make it viable. I, uh, you asked the question, it goes back to your question about whether or not we're serious about agriculture. And I think it goes, just, it, it goes beyond more than being serious. It's easy to stand up on a political platform and, and speak so highly of agriculture. This is our plans to invest in agriculture, diversification. I mean, same old story, same old words, nothing new. So putting aside the aspect of, of being serious, and if we're focusing now on agriculture and tourism, or agriculture within tourism and ecotourism, you have to ask whether or not we are confident in our product. Because Let's go back to the marketing aspect of it. Mm. Yes, we have this division and we have this ministry and we have this entity. You know, uh, however, are we, are we confident in our own products to the extent that we actually let, consider great marketing of it? Let's, let's put it this way. I could be wrong, but from what I understand, we're cheaper than Barbados. We and are. They and they still outsell us. Yes, but because Barbados could probably do that going with the fact that tourists prefer to visit Barbados. Why? Why? I, well, you have to ask whether or not it's the marketing. Whether or it's not, not just I, the marketing. And I'm not, and I'm not just stating this. That's probably one perspective. It's not, but, 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 but that's well, part of th it. That's one perspective. Now, I'm not in Barbados, and I actually have not kept up to date with the situation in terms of what's happening locally in Barbados. Mm -hmm. But what about the crime in, in, in Barbados? That's another aspect of it. You're hearing warnings from the US government, from the British government, right. warning and, and its and citizens. Tobago, and yes. Tobago, you could argue, is one of the safest areas, despite the fact that they have been. We've heard these stories with regards to people uh, and certain violent crimes being committed in Tobago. But at the end of the day, the, the murder rate there is not like what you would see, at least in Trinidad. So if we could live in Trinidad and feel okay, Tobago should be very easy. Am I unfair in making the statement that Tobagonians tend to be more warm and welcoming than Trinidadians? I think that's unfair. You think that's unfair? I think that's unfair. Why? Why is this unfair? I, I, my experience in Tobago, I, I harp on about it all the time. And, and they were so warm and welcoming. In, in Trinidad, you we, have to, they say you have to be very careful who you we, talk to. We treat each other 
we don't treat each other as well as we treat foreigners. So our own individual experiences, either way, is not necessarily best um, determining factor. Right? I would not say that Trinidadians are not as, as, as warm as Tobagonians. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you, there are situations with regards to Trinidad, especially where foreigners coming in, immigrants, illegal immigrants, not just from uh, Venezuela or Colombia, but also from other parts of the Caribbean, um, Guyana, and even Africa. You know, there have been different, uh, different degrees of welcoming or hostility. But it's hard to judge. I'm not going to be so quick to say that both islands, either island, is better in that regard. Because I've seen good and bad examples, right? But for locals now, as, as Trinidadians, when we want to maybe make the two factors, I will again remind everybody that we tend to take our neighbors for granted. Whether our neighbors are Trinidadians with Tobagonian neighbors or Trinidadians with Trinidadian neighbors. This is not a topic in which we're trying to segregate the relationship of Trinidad and Tobago. We're not in any way trying to classify two islands as being separated to one another. Yes, they're, they're distinct features and they're certainly uh, unique personalities amongst both islands, between both islands, but it's not a conversation to actually try and separate the unity. It's a conversation to try and figure out exactly what more can we do and where else can we go. What we're going to do, we're going to take a break on the program now and return. We are going to focus on a couple of topics. We have, we have about uh, two topics to get into. Yeah, so, both of them related to Tobago, right? Both of them related to Tobago. But I again. think it's very important as what you said with regards to divisions and, and, and Certainly, unity. certainly. Uh, but unfortunately, one of the topics surrounds a bit of political division. We will explore that when we return to Talking Point. The issue, the continued rise in the price of flour and its impact on the cost of living in Trinidad and Tobago. How should we go about it? I want to ask you what has been revealed to you about the state of vulnerability in the country because of, of this exercise and because of, of what we're going through. Is the government losing the war on the vaccine front? The discussion should revolve around the common good for the greatest number of people in Trinidad and Tobago. How do we inculcate a sense of respect and regard for people who may not be of your own political ilk or persuasion. The, the communities are not being used by political opportunists. So yeah. I, I when the I tables accept. are turned, when the tables are turned, okay. it's the same it's the same way. Okay, this has been 10 questions. I'm Andy Johnson and we we'll see you next time. Burning questions, urgent topics, welcome back to one on one. The show where we tackle the most current and pertinent subjects that are affecting all citizens. Where we ask the hard questions and have in-depth conversations. What separates One on One from other talk shows is that the conversation stems from a younger perspective on topics that affect the fabric of our society. One on One, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. on WESN Content Capital. Let your voice be heard. Call Madam Fix It on WESN, the only place that effectively helps you with your woes. Having problems getting onto government agencies, water woes, NIS and pension problems, potholes, and much, much more. Call me, Madam Fix It, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, right here on WESN. Let me fix it for you. Is it politics? What is it? Is it that nobody cares about sport? The kind of support that sport used to get in the past is it's no longer here. The thing is, taking a knee doesn't mean that that's the only thing you're doing on it. Right. Taking a knee along with other stuff. Samantha, what are you looking forward to when you return home to Trinidad and Tobago after winning the title? Thank you very much for speaking it into existence. Is it no pressure on Nicholas Ball? It makes me more motivated to work hard and to go out there and rep the red, white and black. Why are we sending a team to the Winter Olympics? There are a number of Trinbegonians who are in the diaspora and have grown up in winter sport. It's an opportunity that the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee will not close the door. I also believe in the players that we have. Once you can motivate the players, you can get the best out of them. 
We are WESN, the premier platform for Caribbean content. WESN, covering West, East, South and North. WESN, we entertainment, sports and news. WESN, available on Green.7, Amplia 118, Airlink 17, B-Mobile 107, Digital 21, ICN TT 105 and Flow 110. Connect with us at WESNCC or stream online at www.wesncc.com. WESN, your premier platform for Caribbean content. Every word, every line, every paragraph depicts a real moment in someone's life. A father, a sister, a mother, a brother. We at Newsday are dedicated to you, the people, and through independent, unwavering journalism, strive to always bring your stories to life. Because your stories are more than just words. Newsday, independent and credible. It may seem like the hardest thing to do right now, but we all need each other to wear a mask, wash our hands, watch our physical distance, and stay at home. We need you safe. Together we can make the difference. Together we can curb the spread of COVID-19. So let's be responsible in our actions. The Trinidad and Tobago Red Cross Society Mission-based, people-focused, community-driven. Over the last three weeks, the Prime Minister has met with the THA Chief Secretary Folly Augustine twice at a breakfast meeting and then at a luncheon meeting. Uh, at the last meeting, which I believe took place earlier this week, we witnessed the Prime Minister and his cabinet meeting with the Chief Secretary and his secretaries. And I'd like to say, because as we get into this conversation and I'll bring Sean into to this particular point, I truly am happy, I suppose that's the best word to use, because I don't think I'm, it's gratitude as yet, at mm. least. But I, I think I'm very happy to see that the Prime Minister, and by extension his cabinet, by his authority, is actually forming or building a relationship with the Chief Secretary and his secretaries. Now, all this could be public relations, because you, one can make the argument that the Prime Minister doesn't really have much of a choice if they try in any way to disrupt the operations of the THA, at least this new THA, it's all going to be deemed as political due to their loss in the election last year. But I don't even want to explore that. I just simply want to say on the part of the government, the Prime Minister, I applaud his efforts and I certainly applaud that he is taking very much a priority, it would seem, in working with this THA. There's a bit of a downside of which, Sean, I know that you would like to, to really get off your shoulders. Yeah, so the point that you just made, it, it, I, I myself don't necessarily want to think that, oh, the only reason why the government is doing this is because they don't want to look bad. Because at the end of the day, those accusations about not wanting to work with the other side, that is back and forth between government and opposition, you know, both ways, right? When, when the rules were reversed in the previous administration and now. So it, I'm not so sure that it's just about popularity and wanting to repair their image in Tobago. It might be practical. That is the executive of the THA, and you need to be able to work with them to get things done. However, we have even had our, our concerns and, and our suspicions that the Tobago Council and the central government were not always in good communication. So, but and bear in mind, the, the, the council, the Tobago PNM Council, of the PNM, yes. they actually are having internal elections right. in the next coming months. So, but at the end of the day, Dr. B. Israel, she complimented the PNM, right? And, and it, it seemed, and, and there was no hesitation there. There was no caveat there. Um, so the working relationships, at the very least, started off 
extremely well and it gives me a lot of hope that this could be an example something to build upon about collaboration between political parties so that our government could move beyond what we see not just here but globally with this bipartisan tit for tat op opposing for the opposition's sake however it leaves me now even more puzzled because the attorney general started an action against the deputy political leader of the PDP, Watson Duke, because at the time, you know, there was a conflict of interest with uh, Mr. Duke being the deputy, sorry, he's not the deputy political leader, he is the political leader, but he was slated to be the deputy chief secretary while still being the president of the PSA. Um, also having employment in Wasa, but that, 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 is a, that was a, technically a separate issue, you could argue, because he was not active in, in his role. He was on no pay leave. The fact that the court action is continuing after Mr. Duke has resigned from his positions in the PSA leaves me wondering, what is the purpose of this? A total because, waste of, of money. Because, right, a this is not going to achieve any sort of objective that I could figure out. If it was the case where you could see where it would damage Mr. Duke's reputation and harm the PDP, fine. First of all, it goes against the goodwill that you are, that you are creating by working with the PDP, right? Is it that there is something specific to Mr. Duke? Somebody has an axe to grind there. Well, his political career is not the stereotypical one. It, this is, I don't think this is going to be the, the, the instrument that's going to lead to his downfall. Because to some extent, this is pretty tame I compared to all things that's been leveled against him previously. I, I actually think the Attorney General's actions, or his, his, him pursuing this at least, is not going to lead to the downfall as, uh, uh, to Mr. Watson. Well, exactly. you just alluded to. I actually think it's going to make his positioning more stronger and people are actually going to... Because they're going to, to rally behind him. Yes, they will rally behind him even more. Because again, bear in mind, we are now a month and a half into 2022. But still, we can always refer back to the election last year and what that said about but, Tobago and the potential for Trinidad. And it, it wasn't as though the PDP were trying to defend... Uh, Mr. Duke retaining his position. You know, uh, 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 Chief Secretary Augustine, he publicly said, no, this has to, this cannot stand. For all intents and purposes, the party told Mr. Duke, at least the public messaging was, we have to conform. And he did. So, so what is the point of this? Furthermore, Mr. Duke tendered his resignation. He no longer holds a post. I don't know what the Attorney General is, is trying to achieve. Now, perhaps he's trying to set standards for the future, as with most law cases you see they refer to well, in making their arguments. So, so perhaps that. Some of the PDP members are also, from what I understand, WASA employees on no pay leave. Port Authority so, so as well. Right. So part of this, the precedent will then apply to them. However, I don't necessarily think the cases are strong. The, the, the primary argument or, 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 the, or the strongest case was his presidency of the PSA because you cannot be a part of both sides of the negotiations of both sides of the defense. You can't be a significant part of government while also being the chief negotiator against government, right? So now being a, an employee on no pay leave, that's different. Maybe, maybe there is an objective there, a precedent they do want to set that might Leads a further change on how WASA is operating. But if they're on no pay leave, they're not on the payroll. So I kind of am not sure what there practical benefits there is. There is no there. doubt in my mind that the Attorney General's actions, or, or should I say at least his persuasion on this case, is political. There is no doubt that it is political. I think it's a complete waste of time. I don't understand why though. I think it's a complete waste of money. I do not think that this should continue. Mr. Duke has resigned. And again, generally speaking, it is often said that people hate what we refer to as witch hunts, mm. deliberate actions to try and assassinate someone's character yeah. or their position, their office. And I think that because of that, this will actually make Mr. If, Watson Duke's position even stronger. It will affirm and solidify his standing. If they couldn't have, have, have basically used po uh, political arguments to get him out of the PSC before, this isn't really going to make a difference, especially since now that he's off of it. It also, I think this is where the long-term thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm left very confused. You already have a situation where you have to defend your cabinet ministers from calls for them to be sacked, right? For all sorts of claims being thrown at them by the 
by the opposition. At some point, one of them might come under a lawsuit as well. And then you're going to argue, oh, this lawsuit is frivolous and there's no meaning behind it and there's no practical benefit. Except you have set the precedent that politically, it seems to be an okay thing to go after a potential political opponent in the court on a frivolous basis because he is no longer PSA president. It literally, the thing that the lawsuit was supposed to have been, been started to reverse or to stop, well, that doesn't exist anymore. Anyway, as we conclude this, uh, the THA is represented by former Attorney General Ramesh Lawrence Mirage. Chief Secretary Fali Augustine is represented by former Attorney General John Jeremy. And Mr. Duke is represented by former Attorney General Anna Ram Logan. It's three Attorney Generals versus the current Attorney General. That's, that's not fair. That's going to be fun. That's like three and a half. That, that's going to be fun to view. Anyway, folks, uh, make light of the situation as much as possible. But even though this is a blot on the part of the government's uh, dealings with the TJ, I still uh, hopefully, would... hopefully it will it will be minor and it will remain minor and it will not turn into anything. I more. don't even think it's minor. I think right now this is a big thing. Yeah, I, I, know. I don't think and mainstream I'm, and I'm media hoping, has focused on I'm it much. I'm hoping but... it goes away. There's nothing. The country has nothing to gain from this. But I will still conclude this particular conversation by again stating that the collaboration and the willingness to meet with the secretaries and work with the secretaries and the teaching on the part of the prime minister and the government i applaud that i hope that continues i champion it and i encourage it so well done and let's see this partnership continue to progress and hopefully it will be an effective one let us now take a break here on the program. When we return, we're focusing on intellectual property rights this morning, specifically on agriculture and agricultural research and development. You're watching Talking Points on the Content Capital. This is WESN. Gift giving during a lockdown can still be hassle-free with a gift from FanZone with delivery options available nationwide. Visit and browse our Facebook and Instagram pages for all your official licensed merchandise and apparel and have it delivered to your door. Find us on Facebook and Instagram. FanZone, we've got you covered. The best for your baby is at thebesttoys.com. From the best strollers, car seats, baby carriers, high chairs, booster seats, rockers, jumpers and bouncers, walkers, baby blankets, feeding accessories, bathtubs. Visit us in store at Horses Flagship McVean. Shop online now at dbesttoys.com. Order via call or WhatsApp at 332-BABY. And remember, we have the best toys at the best prices. People really want to know, what about me? Where do I fit? Yes. What is in the ride for me in terms of a better Trinidad and Tobago? And I'm pleased to shed some light on that. The purpose of bail is to ensure your attendance at court. That's it. It is not punitive. It is not rehabilitative. We the police officers, we are professional. And we are here for whenever the survivor is ready to come forward. We have the right to private and family life, the right to religious freedoms and beliefs and thoughts and expression. But these rights are not absolute. Certain rights can be limited. The law is to govern. The whole is for all of us in public. Join me, Sule A. Joseph, as I delve into the day-to-day -day psychological issues plaguing our society. We will discuss behaviours that encompass the biological influences, social pressures and environmental factors that affect how you think, act and feel. Sight, Thursdays at 11.30am, only on WESN, Content Capital. Every word, every line, every paragraph depicts a real moment in someone's life. A father, a sister, a mother, a brother. We at Newsday are dedicated to you, the people, and through independent, unwavering journalism, strive to always bring your stories to life. Because your stories are more than just words. Newsday, independent and credible.
Welcome back to Talking Points here on WESN, the content capital. This morning we're speaking about intellectual property rights. And just to give you a, a very brief definition, and perhaps our guests will correct me on this, intellectual property is basically legal protection for creators and inventors and their work. That is just a very vague, brief definition. Uh, but joining us now via Zoom to have that conversation and specifically on agriculture and research and development is Dr. Justin Koo. He is the Deputy Dean of Graduate Studies and a lecturer at the Faculty of Law, UE St. Augustine campus. Good morning, Dr. Koo. Morning, Keita, and thanks for having me. A pleasure to have you with us, Dr. Koo. Uh, well, that was just a very brief definition. Feel free to correct me or, or elaborate a bit further on that. But specifically in terms of IP, IP rights and law, in terms of uh, research and development, is IP in itself uh, a pro or a con in terms of trying to basically persuade investors to, listen, come to this industry, you will get great returns and benefits from it? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's it's definitely a pro. I mean, I think if we're going to talk percentages, it's 95% pro, 5% uh, con, and the 5% I'll talk about after. But in terms of the pros, absolutely investors want to see that persons involved in agriculture have intellectual property rights. Um, we can be talking about patents, about the ways, invent related inventions, about the ways in which we do things in agriculture. It could be about plant variety protection to protect the different strains of, um, you know, act the actual plants or fruits that we're talking about. So, for example, if you come up with a hybrid strain of a pepper, um, a new form of uh, cocoa, that sort of thing, you could get a plant variety mm. protection for that. Um, you might also have, uh, let's say, copyright for an, in terms of a manual, in terms of how you go about your agricultural process, whether it's the processing, it's the harvesting, it's the planting. Um, so IP touches on multiple elements and areas of agriculture. And these are the actually the things that um, investors look for when choosing to invest in a business. They want to know what level of protection do you have over your practice, over your products. If I invest in this, can someone just run up behind me and, and ride on my coattails and use what you're doing for free and therefore um, don't need to put out the massive research and development investment and therefore they get an advantage for spending no money. And that's where IP comes in. Because with intellectual property rights, you have a certain level of monopolistic control over whatever it is you have protected. So again, coming back to if it's an invention related to you know the processing or manufacturing of agricultural products, um, no one else can do that without your permission. So if it, you it, have a plant variety strain, nobody mm -hmm. can use that particular plant without your permission. So it obviously does play a, a key role in attracting investors, but you just use it to uh, monopolistic opportunity. Right. Uh, and with that, let's now look at, at the 5%, the con, essentially. Um, how much of, of a con is it in terms of monopolistic uh, entity being able to now push up the price of, of agricultural goods and perhaps services because it falls under eye prote protection and rights? Yeah, and, and that's always a fair concern because there's a, na a natural nexus between competition law and intellectual property law. So the nexus there is really the fact that because you have this sort of pseudo monopolistic control and in the context of patents, you do have a, you know, a monopoly over that item for almost you know, 20 years in essence. Um, it does mean that no one else can use that particular process or that particular manufacturing method or your particular product or invention without their permission. Um, and that does allow for price gouging in some circumstances, but there's competition law to, um, to address that. In the context of agriculture, I don't think it's as straightforward as, well, I want this patent, um, I'm just going to raise the prices of my types of tomatoes or my type of cocoa. Um, you know, there are collective growers agreements, there are um, certain social norms which dictate the pricing of, of, of products in the agricultural industry. So I think there are built-in mechanisms to help avoid that problem. But I think we have to think about it in a different way as well. We need to consider the fact that in order to get intellectual property, it is expensive in some instances because you have to spend the money on the research and development. Mm -hmm. You also have to spend the money to register your patents, um, register a design right, um, you know, get a plant variety protection. That involves a lot of money. So it's also costly for farmers or persons involved in agriculture to get the IP in certain instances. And that's why you need that level of monopolistic control because you also need to recoup those expenses. Well, so 
not everybody will necessarily be aware of that level of agriculture in TNT. Most people think of agriculture where, well, you have seeds, you plant your crop, you get seeds from that crop to, to, to plant the next crop. Maybe some might understand crop rotation and a few other basics, but with regards to IP protections in TNT, what actually do we have? What is the activities that, that, that have the requirements of um, IT, intellectual property experts in agriculture? Because you're not the only one that I know of, but it, it's kind of interesting. I'm not, myself, I'm not entirely sure what is it that in the field that we have here. Is it that we have research and development locally that needs to be protected? Or is it that we have a lot of foreign IP products being brought down to try to help our agriculture um, moving forward? Yeah, so that, that's a great question slash comment because, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll draw your attention to the cocoa research unit at UV St. Augustine. They're doing fantastic work there with cocoa specifically. Um, and I know for a fact that coming out of this, they have, uh, you know, been working on, on mechanisms that can be put into, into effect in the field. Um, I'm pretty sure they're doing some work on the cocoa genome. So looking to see, can I get a different strain of cocoa that probably makes a bigger cocoa pod, a sweeter cocoa, that sort of thing. Um, I know in other areas of agriculture, there are persons who have gotten patterns for their um, inventions to relating to you know, some process aspect of growing plants or processing the plants. Um, there are persons who have applied for and received uh, plant protection for their varieties, their hybrid varieties. And I think that's where we need to be looking, um, developing new hybrid varieties of certain plants. So we know we have a competitive advantage with peppers. You know, we have the scorpion mm. pepper, we have the ghost pepper, those kinds of things. Let's work on the next pepper. Um, you know, cocoa, we have a natural advantage with our quality of cocoa or fine cocoa. Um, these are the things that we need to focus on. There is a lot of things that are being imported but not everything necessarily will work for the Trinidad setup. So we need to also consider what is different about our climate, what is different about our soil type. And all, all, all this research is being done. But the question is, when they do come up with things to help us um, in our agricultural industry, are they seeking the protections and are they seeking the sort of um, assistance to help them get this competitive advantage from these things? Because ultimately... This can also be exported, and then that becomes a secondary mm -hmm. product of the agricultural industry, as where in, you can manufacture these things and sell it. As in, could the property rights also could be licensed out as well, not just the, the yeah, the, exactly. The product. Well, yeah. So, so uh, just a follow up, I have to ask because the implication of what you just said is that we might be at a disadvantage trying to follow the trends abroad. And we need to develop our own products. And usually when we think of manufacture, we think of you know, some sort of industrial steel, um, um, some sort of manufacturing. But rather, we should maybe consider manufacturing our own agricultural product, developing it. And maybe that might be the avenue for our agricultural sector to really be an exporter. Is, is, is that a fair statement to make? Yeah, no, I mean, I definitely think so. And, and we could be talking about, well, is it the manufacturing of hybrid seeds? Is the manufacturing of a particular product that helps the growth of plants that are native and, you know, that we have that competitive advantage in relation to? So, you know, cocoa for something for sure. I mean, I'm a big fan and proponent of marijuana cultivation. I think that's our way out of the foreign exchange crisis that we have. Mm -hmm. You know, we have persons growing marijuana, I mean, now it's decriminalized. It's still not fully legalized. I know there's the, the bill before Parliament that is hopefully will, will be discussed soon. But I think this is something that growing the boutique marijuana, you know, and then it's a whole industry in itself. Because, yeah, it's not just growing, you know, the seeds and selling the seeds or selling the plants. There's processing of marijuana. There is, you know, the sort of tools and implements that accompany marijuana. You know, I think persons here are innovative. We have creative persons and they can develop and create things to support that industry. Um, so that's one way I'm thinking that IP and agriculture helps Trinidad and Tobago, you know, get ahead of the issue that we have with uh, being a net importer. We can also mm. start to think about how do we use agriculture to become a net exporter. Well, using the example that you would have just referred to seeds. Now, speaking generally on seeds, uh, let's say, for example, I'm an investor uh, who has now come and invest in research and development through that innovation transpired and I produced a, a seed that is 
uh, certainly will gain a lot more in terms of planting, harvesting. Uh, now, I'd like to share this product, but I need returns on it. So let's take a look at, for example, non-exclusive patent licensing. I mean, that in itself is key to generating revenue on investment. But when you look at royalties associated with that, is there any sort of, uh, any sort of intervention on the part of the authorities to ensure that they're not high royalties uh, to these licenses and that it may make it more accessible and so the market can actually have a greater share and greater perhaps reach of this product? Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a great question. Because, I mean, you want to have a setup where, yes, somebody owns this particular item or product because they own the intellectual property rights, but at the same time, you want the industry to grow as a whole. And I think this is where collective groups come in, collective farm uh, or collective agricultural setups. Um, we see the collective cocoa growers. I think we need to have that set up across the board for all the different types of agricultural products that we want to pursue. Um, so I think they need to set their policies internally to dictate, well, okay, even though this particular entity might have the, the patent or plant variety protection or whatever, a trade secret even, um, that it is shared with the group. So the group as a whole benefits because one of the big problems with agriculture in Trinidad is that in order to become a net exporter, we need to grow the quantity. Um, so, for example, cocoa or fine cocoa. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest issues we face is that, you know, how much we can physically export is such a minuscule level on the international market mm. that we're restricted to, uh, to, to sort of ex exporting as, you know, boutique manufacturer or um, fine cocoa for, you know, set instances. You know, we can't compete and supply Cadbury's, for example. So that's not the kind of export we need to be looking for. Um, and this is now where things like trademarks and branding and geographical indications come in. So certain growers, um, I mean, in Jamaica, for example, we'll be familiar with Blue Mountain Coffee. They mm -hmm. have a geographical indication. In Trinidad, we have um, the Montserrat Hills um, set up. We have the Maruga set up as well. So we have rice, we have cocoa for GIs. Um, we need to start building on that more broadly and then have the branding as well. So when we think about champagne, for example, you know, everyone knows mm -hmm. champagne, right? But champagne is really just sparkling white wine from the champagne region. Um, there's no reason why people can't know about, let's say, a particular pepper with particular qualities that is grown somewhere in Trinidad that is suitable. Um, and that's not where we need to start leveraging the brand elements, the trademark elements of, of uh, intellectual property. Um, you know, it's not just about growing the product and making the product. You need to make the product. Uh, uh, presentable to sell mm. because on the international market people are not going to buy it unless they have that aesthetic element so that people feel enticed to buy it what makes your product different from anyone else's because chances are you're going to have cheaper products on the market and that's now where the brand identity using trademarks and branding really comes important if i register a trademark for a product that uh, I, I developed in trinidad and tobago uh, would I have to register that product to say that it's exclusive and solely all the rights to this, uh, the development and everything that went into this product becoming what it is, is, is mine? Do I have to register that in every single country that I would want to export this product to? Yeah, so you will have to, wherever, because trademarks are territorial, just like patents um, and design rights. Wherever you want to exploit that particular product or that particular brand, you do need to register. Um, the saving grace for us in Trinidad and Tobago is that the Intellectual Property Office has done fantastic work in updating and modernizing our trademark act. So we have the 2015 trademark act, which basically um, allowed us to accede to the uh, Madrid Protocol, which means that if you have a trademark in Trinidad, you can then file one subsequent application under the Madrid Protocol. And you can gain access to trademark markets across the world. Um, it's at mm. present, I think, over 100 um, countries are signed on to the Madrid Protocol. So all you need to do is file one additional application, and you can have access to multiple trademark registrations with that one application. Uh, so, Doctor, I want to switch the conversation just ever so slightly. Now, you have said, OK, we have the potential to have products that could be differentiated and therefore that could be successful um, on the world market. One of the things is we're a really small country. So I just have to ask, it's, it's, I think it's one of the things that everybody might be wondering, do we literally have enough space to make uh, widespread agriculture and to be a mass producer? 
maybe just of one product or maybe of multiple products. The three examples you gave there, uh, chocolate, pepper, and if, well, cocoa, pepper, and when it becomes legal, marijuana. Do we have the space for that? Do we have the capability for that, the manpower for that, the expertise on that level? Because I'm sure, yes, we might have the scientists to develop it, but then now the growers to really um, put in the work. Yeah, I, I, I suppose that is the critical question. Do we have the physical resources to do this? Land, um, soil, uh, human personnel, right? So labor. Um, I wouldn't claim to be an expert in this area, so I feel you might have to direct this to mm. someone else who works in the agricultural department at UWE, because um, I'm sure they can tell you about the, the, the resource limitations of, of being, becoming a major producer of agriculture. Um, but I think if we approach it um, in the right way, and if we do an IP-led approach, so we're focusing on you know, not necessarily mass production, but boutique production, fine crafted products, because I think Trinidad and Tobago is a, is a great example that we can produce fine crafted products at a high level. Um, you know, I think that is sustainable. Can we compete with, you know, the cocoa growers in Africa? I, you know, absolutely right. not. We just don't have the resources. But, but, but like Blue Mountain Coffee, it's, it's within the realm of possibility. Yeah, definitely. Because, I mean, if you take Blue Mountain Coffee as an example, I mean, I, I think they do produce a lot more and maybe it's because of the nature of, of, of the coffee bean. But again, maybe, you know, if you look at the coffee beans coming from Jamaica versus coffee beans coming from Ethiopia, for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're probably not looking at any near comparison in the quantity being produced. But there's that fine uh, quality element to the Blue Mountain coffee. And I, I think, we, you know, we have that with cocoa. I think we can have that with, with the peppers as well and with, you know, marijuana and other products that might, we might have, yeah. Dr. Koo, we just have about uh, two minutes left, so I, I just have two quick questions. First of all, just to get a better understanding, when you mentioned the uh, boutique product, that, uh, that falls under hybrid? Hybrids are boutique products in itself? I would say hybrid and quality, um, because you can get a mass-produced product that isn't necessarily of a high quality. Mm -hmm. When you look at our cocoa, it's fine cocoa. It is of the highest quality around the globe. So. That's the, that's the level we need to aim for because people know Trinidad cocoa and for its specific qualities. Same way people know Blue Mountain coffee for its specific qualities. Right. Um, that's where we need to focus, not necessarily on just general items. And, and finally, as we wrap up this interview, I know my, my coach and colleague just spoke um, on, on the resources available to us, um, but more so you mentioned uh, the IPO. Um, Trinidad and Tobago, in terms of the laws, we've constantly had a conversation around diversity, uh, around agriculture, and, and hopefully developing an agricultural industry and sector. But have we actually taken intellectual property into consideration in terms of strongly reviewing it and ensuring that we have everything in place to proceed with uh, this particular industry and market? It doesn't make sense uh, it, uh, trying to attract investors if we do not have robust laws? Yeah. Um, I, I, what I want to say is that I think Trinidad and Tobago, in the Western Hemisphere, anywhere in the world you want to look at, has a very robust intellectual property framework. The laws are there. Um, you know, there's a common myth that we don't have strong intellectual property laws, or in some instances, we don't have laws at all. That's absolutely untrue. Um, we have a very robust framework. I think where we fall down is enforcement. Of course, it could be better. There, there are tweaks and changes to be made and amendments, of course. Um, but the, the basis of the framework is there. Everything is there ripe for exploitation. It's really now just to figure out the good product to put forward, finding investment, and then having the business and professional side of all of our industries develop. And that's not just for agriculture. That's for the creative sector. That's for the manufacturing sector. You know, we need to have that sense of professionalism um, in order to compete on a global market. And mm. I, I think those are more cultural and societal issues rather than things based on intellectual property or the quality of the items we can produce. Dr. Justin Koo, for your time and for the knowledge you would have shared with us, thank you very much, sir, for this morning's interview. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Koo. Thanks very much for having me. A pleasure, sir. You take care and keep well. All the best. Cheers. Dr. Justin Koo, he is the Deputy Dean, Graduate Studies and a lecturer at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine Campus, Faculty of Law. Folks, we break for news on the hour and uh, when we return, we open up the phone lines this morning. Stay tuned to Talking Point.
seven is out. All day is in. WESN News on the hour. Every day, we communicate through stories. Stories of ourselves, our challenges, our goals, our experiences, and our aspirations. Storytelling is an art. An art that we have mastered. WESN Film Studios comprises a collaborative team of experts with extensive industry experience locally, regionally, and internationally. The ability of your business to successfully communicate with your preferred audience depends on the strength of the stories you tell. Your vision should be communicated in a high quality, professional, and creative way. From concept to post-production, advertising to film, multi-camera productions, live events, streaming and virtual conferencing, we are WESN Film Studio. Let your own unique voice be heard and your vision realized. Call us today at 628-5835 for your next production. In this season, we talk more about health, wellness, and everything in between. I am so excited to share with you everything about health and wellness so that you can design the life that you've always dreamed of. Join me here on What's Up Doc. What's Up Doc, Tuesdays and Thursdays here on WESN, Content Capital. People really want to know what about me, where do I fit? Yes. What is in the ride for me in terms of a better Trinidad and Tobago? And I'm pleased to shed some light on that. The purpose of bail is to ensure your attendance at court. That's it. It is not punitive. It is not rehabilitative. We the police officers, we are professional. And we are here for whenever the survivor is ready to come forward. We have the right to private and family life, the right to religious freedoms and beliefs and thoughts and expression. But these rights are not absolute. Certain rights can be limited. The law is to govern. The whole is for all of us in public. What's the best way to grab the attention of viewers? Please exercise more patience. You have to be kidding me. Doing what we do best. I'll say at the very least it's a conspiracy of laziness against the people. Join me, Keaton Shaw. And me, Sean Michael Small, for Talking Point. Weekdays from 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. We go in-depth on the trending issues and engage the most controversial newsmakers as we get them to account to the people for their actions. You can't go to the government with nothing. You can't go to cabinet yeah. with an with a, with a empty hand, with a wish. I'm mm -hmm. glad that we're having this a sober, mature discussion. In the present situation, I expect a continuation of the chaos. Join, Join us for, for the, the discussion, discussion, Mondays to Fridays, only on WESN, the content capital. Is it politics? What is it? Is it that nobody cares about sports? The kind of support that sport used to get in the past is, is no longer here. The thing is, taking a knee doesn't mean that that's the only thing you're doing on Right. Taking a knee along with other stuff. Samantha, what are you looking forward to when you return home to Trent Tobago after winning the title? Thank you very much for speaking it into existence. Is it no pressure on Nicholas Ball? It makes me more motivated to work hard and to go all day and rep the red, white and black. Why are we sending a team to the Winter Olympics? There are a number of Trinbegonians who are in the diaspora and have grown up in winter sport. It's an opportunity that the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee will not close the door. I also believe in the players that we have. Once you can motivate the players, you can get the best out of them. I a reminder from WESN, we urge you to protect yourself and others from the spread of COVID-19. Stay safe by taking some simple precautions. 
Clean your hands often. Use soap and water or an alcohol-based hand rub. Maintain a safe distance from anyone who is coughing or sneezing. Wear a mask. Don't touch your eyes, nose or mouth. Cover your nose and mouth with your bent elbow or a tissue when you cough or sneeze. Stay at home. If you have a fever, cough and difficulty breathing, seek medical attention. Following the above can help us all to help each other. Welcome back to Talking Points here on WESN, the content capital. It is Friday. Sean, feeling happy? Well, uh, it's the last of the week, so woohoo, weekend, yeah! Also, last opportunity for you to call in on Talking Point, ladies and gentlemen, so please call in. Let's hear what you have to say. It's you, weekend, you know? You, uh, uh, Celebrate the weekend. You need to sell that a lot better. What? Yeah, <laughs> here are you, folks. Call in and join us on Talking Point now. The numbers are up on your screen, 623-9376-622-9338. Hey, we're looking for some good news this morning. Call in and share it with us. My friend from Santa Cruz, I'm awaiting your call. Good morning, caller from Tobago. Hello, good morning, sir. Good morning, morning sir. I see you had a segment on Tobago earlier. Yes. All right. Now, Tobago started its decline long before... Um, COVID, you know? Yes, yes. That COVID just increased it. Mm -hmm. The decline was started with the with the ferry service. Mm -hmm. All right, and that was more, more massive than COVID. My friend, may I ask a question? Sure. If you had to be a doctor, a nurse, a policeman, an engineer, where in Tobago could you go? You know, interestingly enough, caller, that, mm -hmm. that is something that uh, Sean and I discussed the other day. We said that uh, one of the observations that Tobago does not actually have many dental offices, before, doctor uh, offices. Yeah. And that is before you born. Well, you will be able to tell me that probably. Yeah. Kamala Prasad Bissessa and her entourage mm -hmm. attempted to clear down a place in Tobago here mm -hmm. to build a university, you know. You know, it was shut down by, um, what do you feel name, Ovi London and Co? No, I was not actually aware of that. Okay. See if you get more information on that. Yes, certainly will actually. Thank you for sharing that with me because... Uh, in conversations with Dr. Faith B. Israel, they're definitely pushing for University of Tobago. So, thank you, caller. Right, thank you, caller. Thank you, caller. Actually, interestingly, Sean, the, the caller asked a question, and, and it's amazing because it, it was something that we spoke about in mm -hmm. terms of... Uh, well, it, it, well in terms of medical services or, or, or those types of services, but I think what people need to understand and one of the key elements of Dr. B. Israel's proposal is the, the element of getting foreign students. Because if it's just up to the local population, there just might not be enough students to then justify the, the, the diverse amount of professors and subjects you would need for a full so university. So are they going to pro probably try, because we, we do have a call on the line actually, but uh, are they going to perhaps explore the uh, St. George's University model? That was, I believe, what was more or less the example being used. And it makes sense in that separately, you know, the, the situations are not as strong. But when you put it together, the, 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 the sum total could come out to work very well, particularly if agriculture is on the no, table. SGU. And we just had agriculture, intellectual property. We have, a, we have some things here, is if we could exploit it. SGU is the backbone of the Grenadian economy. So that is perhaps one of the ways Tobago is looking to diversify in terms of education. A good morning, caller from San Fernando. Good morning. Morning. Morning, morning. Um, you know, you talk, you talk, you that segment on, Tob on Tobago, mm -hmm. you spoke about, right? Yes. Between, I had some, just some ideas to, to do, to look at business in Tobago. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, you have to do some research and investigation. Yes. So between 2018 and March of 2020, I ventured to Tobago on no less than 20 occasions. Okay. Let's go to Tobago, book a hotel room, drive around, talk to the people, see what's happening. Tobagonians have shortchanged themselves. There is so much potential for investment in agriculture, mm -hmm. in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. You see tourism? Mm -hmm. Tobagonians haven't scratched the surface of the potential for tourism in Tobago. Yep, yep. Unfortunately, COVID came and I couldn't go ahead with, 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 getting, with not getting information. The issue was, um, you see tourism? Mm -hmm. When you go to uh, to the um, Division of Tourism, they have no statistics. And if you, if you want to in attract investment, you need data. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and they need to start to collect more data. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. But yeah. that's tourism. That's not just Absolutely the Division right. of Tourism of, of the THA back before COVID. That is, I would argue, tourism on a whole. Cola, yeah, I mean, yes, like, yes, of course, of course, of course. Your point on statistics, it is something Government that on a whole. has really, really frustrated me. Have you, I don't know when last you were able to visit the Central Statistical Office website and you will Even notice that- I have been frustrated without CSO <sighs> for, for so many years that I, you, you, you go there before, that is before they, they, had, the, um, they had the website. You, they, they, we just don't collect information. They in don't. The country, don't but don't. The key phrase you said there is so many years because we have to reiterate the point. This is not a specific or individual government. This is a problem that has its history dates back. Yep. We could only guess at this point in time. But it's interesting. Similar to what we see with the public sector entities, it's almost as though governments don't even want to try to, to fix it. They don't see it I, I as a priority. I have to agree with you, have to agree with you on, that, on my last point. I have to agree with you on that. Thank you. Thank you Thank very much, you, Paula. Paula. I share your frustration. I certainly do. In fact, I, uh, last I, time I visited the website, the, the statistics I saw when I, was, I was researching, I think 2011 was the last the time I... the thing is, that also goes into transparency and, and the topic of procurement. But we have a caller from Santa Cruz. Good morning, caller. Wait, wait, hold on. Good morning. Who is this? Good morning. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get some good news today. <laughs> I heard you call me out. This yes, morning. I called you out specifically this morning. It's Friday. So, right. So you want some good news? Huh? I would love some good news. Well, I could tell you some personal good news. Okay. That's wonderful. Share it with us. Okay. I was actually challenged in a phone call with attorneys that I had just met, new attorneys or, you know, my, my mother's estate, challenged to stay quiet for two minutes. And with all the questions that were asked, I won the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I stayed quiet for two minutes, and that came in to help me just yesterday with a very difficult emotional situation where I was actually able to hush my mouth and not to say no. <laughs> Call her. So I won. <laughs> yeah. This is good, but can I ask you, please do me a favor. Do you think you could challenge Sean to stay quiet for two minutes? Not not only show. You do realize generally. you do realize you on at least for the purposes of the broadcast, you speak more than me. Right? <laughs> You do realize that. I, I, I am a bit more serious, my Nicola. I would ask you to challenge our, our political body to not be so long-winded and to maybe be a little, listen a little bit more, at least when it comes to Parliament. Wait. Guys, please. There is one particular um, speaker, senator in that Parliament, that when he speaks, I am begging. I, I don't know how... You know, there's the, the long stick with the hook at the end that mm. that's used, that somebody can't just put it around his neck. Are you, are you able to share his initials with us so we know who you're speaking of? It's kind of like WM, when it's short for William, but um, I don't really want to put anybody on the Wait, We're going to have to double check that. We're gonna have to. <laughs> I mean, I, I would argue a lot of them speak way too long, way too long. 
if, if they just cut what, how, the amount of things they had to say, they could make the same points a lot more effectively. But, you know, who am I to, who is, what's my advice? In, yes, interesting that you're giving that advice. But, Kola, thank you very much uh, for that good news. It's always good hearing from you. Thank you so much, guys. Have a have great day and a great weekend. I, Keaton, I do not monologue for 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile... You know, I think you wish you could monologue for 45 minutes on Talking Points. <laughs> I'm great. Right? But I don't monologue for 45 <laughs> minutes. Good. Okay? I, I'm good. Do we have a, I'm sorry, we have another caller on the line. You see, this is good. We're laughing now. This is good. Good morning, caller. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, morning professor. professor. The problem with Tobago is, as in Trinidad, governance, especially data. I go back to my old administrative report because that mm -hmm. used to be the major source of data mm -hmm. outside of the CSO's um, normal surveys to do. All that has gone. In Tobago itself, the problem is cabinet. We had a thriving agriculture industry over there, which have disappeared. One of the reasons, of course, is cabinet rejected the planner's position for zoning, especially mm. for resort. You have non-enforcement of the state tenancies like in Trinidad for agriculture. The resort service is poor mm. and the prices are high. Bearing in mind that where Tobago is located, is about the most expensive to get to yeah. from the major markets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you used to be a time when all our local airline flights to Trinidad included a free flight to Tobago. It appears that that has been abandoned. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. About 40 years ago, government set up a plan to develop proper fishing depots all over Trinidad and Tobago. I think you had about four or five for Tobago. These was to have full refrigeration and processing and whatnot. This has not been addressed properly. Mm -hmm. Some, a little bit have been done, but not, not for 40 years. A large number of dubious projects are uh, established in Tobago where hundreds of millions of dollars are spent and you have no reports on it. Mm -hmm. And one of the first that was put up was a line processing plant where the Lime Grove was already established in the whole period. That didn't work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any questions. Or no, no, no. I will As say usual, I agree with just about people. everything you said, so I don't, I don't have any questions. Yep, thank, you, I, thank you. I agree with all of it. I, I want to I wanna um, just reiterate lack of planning. And I'm not sure, I think they have it in Trinidad, but it stood out to me in Tobago. Mm -hmm. Right? Just how the development was the lack of planning, the lack of zoning, and then also the lack of reporting. And it makes me wonder, the, the lack of these reports, annual administrative reports, to what extent is that purposeful to reduce transparency and to increase the capacity for, you know, and I'm not talking big corruption, just small for corruption. Applying just for small corruption. Applying for loans, perhaps, international funding. But um, what you said then... Giving out contracts for a zipline project, I mean... Small-scale contracts. What, uh, what the caller from Shigona stated in relation to uh, the fishing depots, I know that was one of the campaign promises on the part of the PDP, specifically for the area of uh, Buko Mount Pleasant. Mm. I know that they and said I mean, they wanted to establish... Listen, a, there's, no, there's no seafood in the country like Tobago seafood, I'm telling you. I'm telling you, people, we just need the restaurant industry to come back now because best place to have fish in the country. We have a caller from Tobago. Fish and currents rule. Good morning, <laughs> Good morning, Kuala. <laughs> Good morning. Morning. Morning, morning. One of the biggest problems we used to have in Tobago is that at every department or every institution, you used to have somebody from Trinidad at the head of the institution. At the end of the week, on Friday, they go back to Trinidad, and on Tuesday, they come back mm. to Tobago. So in one week, you have two days lost, which is Monday and Friday. 
And that used to be a major problem because these people, it come like a holiday in Tobago, and they're not living here to get the experience that the native mm. of Tobago mm. get it. Mm. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Uh, to what extent is a Trinidadian being at the head of uh, whatever in Tobago? Is that an issue? Well, here's the interesting thing. Do, do, I know do, some, people, some people will want to take that conversation in a certain direction. I will take it in this direction. If you constantly have to look outside for someone to be the head of a certain department or a certain entity, mm -hmm. then you, you do not um, foster the ability to, to, to train up people to eventually get to that position. Mm -hmm. Because you're always looking outside. So, yes... You might have an, uh, 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 an office and there's nobody suitable. Tobago is small. That is a very much a possibility. But, you know, and there will be times where you have to look to outside to try to get someone suitable, depending on how niche it is. Mm -hmm. But you should still um, foster that sort of pipeline, that sort of environment where, generally speaking, you try to develop these sort of management skills people. Because the other problem is this. When you don't have a pathway to advancement, well, your best and brightest, they go elsewhere. So, so that's one of the unfortunate consequences if you don't allow it. But the main thing is, if you don't foster an environment where you could develop leaders, you will never develop leaders. And you will always be having to find them elsewhere. And that's not a sustainable thing. This issue in relation to Trinidad and Tobago, and, and, and it... it, it bothers me a bit. Sometimes I, I, I want to be careful in what I'm stating and then at the same time, because you know, people may be quick to interpret it as hatred or yeah. separation. And I, I don't want that to be the case. Divisive. But at the same time, I need to, to, to be open about it. I don't know why there seems to be, regardless of what the politicians tell you, regardless of what they preach, there is a lot of, and maybe hatred is too much of a strong word, but there is a, a lot of, of division. There's a dislike between Trinidad and Tobagonians. We are Trinidad and Tobagonians, and there's such a major dislike that I don't know if sourcing a person from Trinidad in order to be at the helm of whatever institution or authority in Tobago mm -hmm. If that is for reasons that we, we don't like Trinidadians, so we don't want him overseeing us. No, but, but the flip side is that sort of thing adds fuel to that fire. Because I know for a fact that a lot of bright people leave Tobago. They just leave. Why? What are the opportunities there? There are not a lot of um, opportunities for, for high-end employment. A lot of the corporations that are there, the, the command structure, the pyramid is... is Pretty flat because you're talking even Republic Bank, they only have three branches, right? W what are the opportunities for advancement there? Hotels generally are small businesses. Even the biggest of hotels for the most part are, are small, maybe medium businesses. You know, they, 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 it's a sole ownership. It's not like Hilton as in the entire corporation. And then if you do well in Hilton, in one part of the Caribbean, you could, you could maybe apply to, to advancement in a larger Hilton elsewhere. So... They are, the thing is, though, because of the brain drain, you, you have to ask, well, we ha and we have Trinidadians come in to start businesses in Tobago. Mm -hmm. So why is it that there's enough opportunity to bring Trinidadians, but yet there's a disconnect because there's not enough opportunity to be going to leave? And that's one of the things that has to be kind of looked at and brought back into a more reasonable well, equilibrium. Well, the course of this pandemic, Trinidadians were the ones to really help some operators and some... Uh, tourist destinations to, to really well, sustain themselves over the pandemic. Hold right? on, hold on. That's the flip side to the whole relations of the islands because the tourism sector in Tobago, you could argue 80%, eh, maybe more, was more or less being held up by the, the Trinidadian market because there are a lot of challenges for Europeans. We're at the end of the line. You know, there's no Caribbean island south of us. It's South America. You know, they have all of these other islands that have put a lot more investment into their tourism sector. So when the plane lands in TNT, most of the occupants of that plane already disembarked in St. Lucia, Barbados, or what have you. Oh, final call for this morning. Good morning, caller from San Fernando. Gentlemen, I had to just call back to say to you all. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Keaton, you just made a... Uh, uh, um, you, um, you didn't want to say hatred, but it is resentment. 
and, mm-hmm. and this is fueled largely, and this is my opinion that I have, I have drawn over the years, this is fueled largely by Trinidadian people. When they speak in public, athletes, um, ministers, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think people, I know of people, of people who are in the public domain, yeah. they say, when they speak, they talk about Trinidad. And, that, yeah. and I, am not, I am not a Tobagonian, and that upsets me. Yeah. And yeah. you know where it starts? If you would get access to immigration forms when people come into the country, mm-hmm. and you know what they, what they write, what they write there? The address at the end they put Trinidad. They do not put Trinidad and Tobago, and this is a fact. Mm-hmm. And it starts from there. Mm-hmm. And you remember, yeah. if you are if you yeah. are being told that you are second class citizen all the time, you only yeah. hearing this, hearing this, hearing. This, you're going to get, you're going to see feel resentment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, no, okay. I, I understand what you're saying, Colo. I I, I agree, Wh- which is why I try as much as possible to remember to say Trinbagonian. <laughs> this caller from Port of Spain says that he will be the last caller. Good morning, caller from Port of Spain. Good morning, Keaton. Morning, Sean. Good morning. I, I really like this topic because, in a sense, this topic focuses specifically on Tobago. Mm-hmm. And it tells you why Trinidad, all of rural Trinidad, which has tremendous potential for tourism, has been abandoned, neglected, never looked at. What is to say, why do we, as it were, not do what is necessary to enhance and grow tourism in Matlot, San Susi, the East Coast? Mm-hmm. Why do we in Blanchichers, which is perhaps the best possible tourist destination in the country, mm-hmm. in Trinidad and Tobago, note well what I said, in Trinidad and Tobago. I, I will have, I will have to um, disagree with you there. Personally oh, good. I have no job objection to anybody to dis- disagreeing mm-hmm. with me. My name is, is, is not Kay. I, <laughs> I can take criticism. But I, I want to say to you, in the context of possibilities, Blanche shares is tremendous. It is. It and is. Why, why it is. is it they can't even get a road? It takes you, it takes you uh, 45 minutes to cross a road that will normally take you 10 to 15 minutes. Oh, Lord. And, and, and they continue to laugh at you when you call. Say, what is going on? They say, well, you know, the, the Minister of Finance and release no budget. And well, that is nonsense. I, I, I will say and this, And I'm saying though. to you, this has always been that way. Right. And I'm saying to you, it is because the people we have elected over many decades mm-hmm. do not have the foresight the vision nor the understanding. I don't know what they see when they travel other than eating nice food. Mm. But certainly when we travel, we see possibilities that can be implemented in Trinidad. And so I'm pleading with you all guys. Let's talk about San Susi and Matlot. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about Blanchichers, Sejus. Sejus in itself has all kinds of possibilities with what is going on in Latin America. Why haven't we capitalized on it? And that's mm-hmm. all I'm saying. Thank you, Thank Carla. Country, Carla. Thank you, Carla. We're not doing our work. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, I just want to correct you. Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, not just Trinidad. I will say this. Government is supposed to do things that private citizens can't do for themselves. One of those things is infrastructure. And one of the things where we probably should have seen a lot of the investment money go into that was wasted on short-term things would have been to improve infrastructure for a lot of these parts of the country. As well as, I, you could also argue, to improve the infrastructure to the, to the northeastern half of Tobago. <clears throat> well, the more remote regions of the country, if they were opened up more, we could develop them more. But we're hamstrung by, those, by, by, that, by the bottlenecks in our arteries, well, our roadways. Building your roads while forgetting the ones that already exist. Well, right now, they're even, they even anyway, fixing town roads, so I don't to, know. Everybody under pressure. We wrap it up there for now. Um, as we do, Sean, today marks 22 years since the Grand Master of Calypso, Lord Kitchener, passed away. I Yes. Uh, no Lord Kitchener. Yes, I do. I do. Any specific song of his that you enjoy? Always the Bees Melody. That music video, I'll always remember with him kind of dancing around, swatting at invisible bees. But... And, and you can hear Lord Kishin in the background. You can hear Lord Kishin in the background. But you know what? My, my personal well, favorite from the yes, Grandmaster. I, I, I know what this one is. Yes, I know. I know. Back from the old B&B days. I'll just say it that <laughs> way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
You know, my favorite Lord Kitchener song is Pan in A Minor. Oh! Absolutely love that song. Okay, okay. Love it. One of, probably one of his more popular ones. There's there's My Pussin and, and then there's Sugar Boom Boom. There's a... Uh, um, take your meat out my rice. This is a this is a PG show. This is a PG show. <laughs> <laughs> but forever. So you yeah, hang a Lord Kitchen in the background. I ain't gonna lie. I never heard that last one. I've never heard that last really? one. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're kidding. Listen. We're gonna have to change that thing. I was like four at the time or, 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 or younger. You're older than I am. Yes, well, you know what? I I don't know what to say to that folks. Benjamin Button. Eh? Anyway, folks, yeah, that's Peter it. Peter was born, he was 50 out of the womb. What, are, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> this, is, this is Friday afternoon, the last last show of the week. Actually, it's morning. Friday morning. Friday morning, yes, that is true. Afternoon. Afternoon. Anyway, folks, that's it for Talking Point. Thank you very much for joining us. Please stay safe and keep well in your weekend endeavors. And Sean and I, well, we'll see you again on Monday morning. People, we are a land of potential. Don't forget that. We need to do better. We need to do more. We need to be more involved. And don't be complacent, please. Goodbye, folks. Have a great weekend. Up and down the road in this way.